Welcome to the AMATIC 2014 webinar series, Interpreting Graphical Displays of Data with Proxy PEC. And this presentation is sponsored by the Joint Committee of AMATIC and the American Statistical Association, or ASA. So AMATIC is the American Mathematical Association of Two-Year Colleges, and our core value is building expertise and exhibiting leadership in the teaching and learning of mathematics, enhancing personal growth, and improving teaching methods and effectiveness as a personally initiated lifelong responsibility. And so for more information, please visit our website at amatic.org. And please note that the views expressed by the presenter are not necessarily the views of AMATIC, and any commercial products mentioned by presenters are not endorsed by AMATIC. So now we're going to turn it over to Roxy, and she has agreed just to say a few words about herself before she starts as well. So if all of you could welcome Roxy in the chat room, that would be great. All right. Well, thank you. Can, you, can people hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, thank you all for um, for joining me on a on a Monday afternoon in December. I know this is a really busy time of year for everybody, so I appreciate your your uh, taking time out to come to this this webinar. Uh, my name is Roxy Peck, and I am now a professor emerita of statistics at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo in California, um, and I uh, taught at Cal Poly for over 30 years, uh, teaching introductory statistics, and I've also been involved with the AMATIC statistics education efforts for more than a decade, and so I'm um, I'm very happy to be um, to have been asked to do this this webinar. Um, the um, the purpose of this webinar, what we're going to do um, today in the webinar, is we're going to address um, four questions. Um, and uh, what I'm going to I want to tell you a little bit first about where these questions came from. Uh, about a year ago, when the statistics committee of AMATIC um, uh, was uh, looking at webinar ideas, they put out a call for um, members to submit uh, questions that they might like to ask a statistician, things that uh, are things that they would like to know that might um, impact or, or influence uh, some of the things that they did in the classroom. And uh, there were a number of questions submitted, and the four that, um, that we're going to be looking at today were four that were submitted um, by AMATIC members um, that related to the, the uh, topic of interpreting graphical displays. So that's where uh, these questions come from. And when I looked at these questions, it's actually that they're hard questions. And, and the reason they're hard questions is that um, that there aren't really any rote answers. If there were rote answers, we could do this webinar and be done in, in 10 minutes. Uh, but there aren't any rote answers. Um, and the reason that in, uh, faculty members struggle with these questions is because students struggle with these questions. Um, and that's because students, um, especially as their first um, exposure to statistics, um, they're not always comfortable with the ambiguity that comes with, uh, with interpreting results in statistics. And so uh, what we're going to be doing today um, is investigating these four questions together um, in much the same way that you could investigate these questions with your students as they come up, uh, again, not to necessarily lead them to the one true answer, uh, but to at least um, get them to a point where they're a little bit more comfortable having to make some of the judgment calls that we have to make as we analyze data in statistics. So the questions that we're going to be looking at today, um, the first one is just how closely do graphical displays based on sample data tend to resemble population distributions? And we'll, we'll take a look at, at that. Uh, the second question that we're going to be considering um, is an interesting one that was submitted. It says, what does approximately symmetric mean? Um, and how far from symmetric does a distribution have to be before we, we say that it's not approximately symmetric? Uh, there the ambiguity comes in in the word of, um, in terms of the word approximately. We all know what symmetric means, uh, but when we're, we're interpreting data displays, um, the question is when, when can we say approximately symmetric and when does, is it not even approximately? Um, the third question um, is one related to normal probability plots. Um, and the question that came in was uh, just just how far from linear does a pattern in a normal probability plot have to be before we would say that the population distribution 
is not normal. And if you're not familiar with normal probability plots, it's not always a topic in the introductory statistics course. I will talk a little bit more about what they are um, when we get to this question um, and also uh, try and make a case for why we might want to uh, make them a part of our uh, the curriculum and introductory statistics if they're not already part of your uh, of your curriculum. And then finally, and this is one where if time permits, um, we'll also take a look at uh, what kinds of patterns and residual plots should cause us to question whether a linear model is appropriate or not. Um, so you can see they're, they're very different questions. Some of them are related um, to each other, but the one thing that they all have in common is this idea of having to make judgment calls um, when we're looking at uh, graphical displays. And then the, the other, I think, uh, and, and a really interesting question that goes along with each of these um, is what's the role of sample size in terms of making these judgment calls? Because we don't often stop and, and address sample size issues in the context of graphical displays, but sample size also plays a big role here um, as it does with um, in, in other uh, areas of the intro course. So we'll take a look at, at that as well. Okay. Um, all right, well, so um, we're going to start um, by taking a look at that first question, which was how closely do graphical displays based on sample data tend to resemble the population distribution? And this on the surface seems like a simple question, um, but I, I think you'll see as we start to look at some examples that it isn't, uh, it, it, it may be a little bit um, more subtle than, than what we sometimes um, think and what we sometimes lead students to to believe. And the way that I think that I want to uh, deal with all of these questions is to actually uh, to uh, do an investigation that will help us try and, and answer uh, or at least come to some uh, develop some sort of uh, sense of, of how these questions might be answered. And so we're going to look at this question by starting with a population distribution that you see displayed on your screen. Um, and you can see that this population distribution um, is a very skewed distribution. In fact, I generated um, this population distribution from um, a chi-square distribution with two degrees of freedom, so very, uh, a very skewed distribution. And I want you to think for a moment about what you think um, the distribution would look like if we were to take a random sample of size 25 from this population. So I'll give you a minute to, uh, to, to think about that. Um, and then um, what I like to do with students is to, uh, to then uh, look at some random samples that have been selected uh, from this particular population. So we're looking at samples of size 25, and one of the things that sometimes surprises people is I think that they expect the sample distributions to look a lot more like the population distribution than they actually do uh, sometimes in practice. So if you take a look at this slide, you'll see down at the bottom um, dot plots that are made um, for four different random samples. And I resisted the urge when I took these random samples. I resisted the urge to um, uh, to reject some of them and take another one so that it would look <laughs> look uh, uh, look better. Um, but if you take a look at this. Um, I think most people would say that the only one that really resembles the population distribution in terms of shape um, would be this sample number three um, that's that's shown uh, in those bottom dot plots. Um, the other um, dot plots uh, look if if we say well they do have some similarities to the population distribution. Um, in particular, they're all sort of centered in the same place. And I think that the spread that you see, the variability that you see in the samples is reflective of the variability in the population. Um, but shape is really tricky. And this is one of the lessons that I think is, um, is, is really important, is that um, from dot plots um, and from other graphical displays, even with samples of size 25, random samples of size 25, we don't always get a good picture of the shape of the population. Center and spread much easier um, and much more likely to be reflected in the sample um, than, uh, than shape. Um, so where does that lead us? Well, 
what uh, I guess the question to, to look at next is is what about samples of size 50? Uh, so what if we take the sample size to be larger? Uh, what what would you expect there? And what about samples of size 10? Okay, so I don't know if you have any thoughts, but I think that on that, I mean, I'm sure you do have some thoughts on that, but um, but uh, most people, I think, would say, well, samples of size 50, I mean, our sense is that the larger the sample size, the more likely um, we would be to see the shape of the distribution uh, reflected in the distribution of the sample, um, as well as um, uh, the center and spread. Um, but if we weren't all that excited about the samples of size 25 um, giving us a good picture of the shape of the population, um, then samples of size 10 um, might even be more, I guess, uh, uh, you know, we, more troublesome. Um, and so let's take a look at that. And again, I like to have students um, actually do this random sampling if you have access to technology in your in your classroom. Uh, these graphs and technology were all done just using the statistics software that we use in our in our class that, that and that uh, software uh, allows you to select a random sample from a predefined population which is is what uh, I've done here. Um, so what you're seeing at the bottom of the screen here um, are dot plots for four different random samples of size 50. Um, and uh, what we see here is a much better indication in the dot plots, I think, of the shape. Uh, again, they're all sort of centered um, at about the same place as the population, although sometimes it's very hard to, to judge center um, when you have a very skewed distribution like this, but they all tend to be reflecting the center and the variability in the population. Um, but here with samples of size 50, we get a much better indication of um, of the shape of the population. Um, although this sample 8, the one down at the bottom there, um, you can see we had a kind of a weird thing happen here and this is where when you do these kinds of things with students, um, you have to resist. I mean my first reaction is if I were going to do this with a class would be to take this sample 8 and get rid of it and replace it with a different random sample. Um, but part of, the, um, part of the goal here is to actually get them to see that um, that there is this sample to sample variability um, that can cause us to make incorrect um, conclusions about a population based on a sample even in um, even in graphical displays um, here. Right. Um, so samples of size 10, here's where the real dilemma comes in. Um, this is, as you, you know, a very skewed population. Um, samples of size 10, these are the dot plots um, for four different random samples of size 10. Um, and you can see here again, um, we're getting a sort of a picture of variability, although not nearly as good as before. Um, that doesn't surprise us that, um, that uh, sample statistics would vary more from sample to sample and from sample to population for small samples. But in terms of um, trying to get information about the shape of the population distribution, um, for small samples, samples as, as small as size 10, um, it's really difficult to look at these and to say, uh, yes, you know, from looking at this dot plot, I think the population is um, is, is skewed or certainly has, uh, you know, I would not have much of an indication it has the shape that it does. A uh, sample 10 that you see that has the one um, uh, outlier that sticks out and to some extent sample 9 that also has kind of some extreme observations uh, give me an indication um, that there may be some sort of skewness but uh, to be honest if I were to look at samples 11 and 12 um, and uh, were asked do, do I think these could have been samples from say a normal distribution which is very far from what we've got in this population um, I would have to say yeah they might they might be there's no uh, in this picture to me I'm not seeing a clear indication of the skewness um, that we see in that population distribution. So this is a this is a problem because when do we care, really care, about the shape of the population distribution? Well, 
all of our inference procedures for small samples are based on an assumption um, of, or well, not all of them, but, but many of them are based on the assumption of population normality. Um, and we make a big deal, rightly so, about checking assumptions. Um, but this kind of raises the question about, well, if I have to make the assumption that the population distribution is normal, or at least approximately normal, or at least approximately symmetric, um, how do I do that with small uh, samples? Uh, because the dot plots that we just saw, let me go back to that previous slide, um, the dot plots that we just saw, certainly for samples 11 and 12, um, I think the typical response would be to say, Yes, you know, based on this, um, it's reasonable to assume that the population distribution is at least approximately normal and proceed with the, um, with the, you know, inference procedures that depend on that, um, when in fact these are samples from a population that looks like this and conclusions based on our inference procedures could be um, could have error rates that are much larger um, than than we would have expected. So this is a really, um, a really, <laughs> you know, kind of a, a disturbing thing when you first uh, uh, first look at it. So one question that um, you know that we might look at is, well, maybe you know, is there if we have to to um, assess normality or symmetry in a population um, if these dot plots with small samples is not a good approach, um, would some other approach be better like a box plot or a normal probability plot? Um, and so this is another thing we could look at for those same four samples of size 10. Um, here are what the box plots would look like. And this kind of highlights one of the big um, I guess misconceptions about box plots as well, um, and and that is that especially with small samples, um, box plots are not very good for assessing shape of a distribution. Um, they're just a plot of that five number summary. We can get some information about shape if the sample size is very large, but for small samples, box plots don't tell us a lot about shape. Um, again, these first two samples, the ones that the dot plot suggested might be a problem, um, might be an indication here that we wouldn't want to proceed with a t-test, for example, uh, the outlier here. And then remember, there was an outlier here, although it's not, it wasn't enough to show up as an outlier on a uh, on the box plot. Um, but we're seeing some lack of symmetry here. But in a sample of size 10, um, where this median line is placed in in the uh, box up in that uh, box for sample 10, is um, I mean could be. Uh, it, it, just a function of one observation changing by a little could change the whole look of that box plot. Um, so even though dot plots and box plots are the tools we usually use to check uh, for you know, that normality assumption um, in inference, um, neither of them actually works very well in terms of, of um, uh, telling us much about the shape of the population um, that the sample was selected from. Uh, here's what the normal probability plots um, look like for those samples. And this is uh, when I said I was going to try and make a case for, for um, maybe doing a little bit more with normal probability plots in the introductory course. This is, this is kind of the start of my case for that. Um, because here I think this is the only set of plots um, that we've looked at so far um, that would have given me a good indication of uh, that the sample that the samples are not from a normal population um, for all four of those samples from that very skewed population. Um, as I said, I'll talk a little bit more about normal probability plots coming up a little later. Uh, but the main indication, if you're not familiar with them, um, is that if uh, you have a sample from a normal population, we expect the, um, these normal probability plots to show a linear pattern. And um, if you look at these four um, plots based on the sample of size 10, I think you can see uh, all four of them would be described as, as not being, um, being really linear. Um, so this is uh, kind of an interesting, I think, case, builds, builds sort of an interesting case um, to say that if we're doing a graphical display um, as part of a check of assumptions and in inference, um, that maybe the normal probability plot is the tool we ought to be using rather than a box plot or, uh, or a dot plot.
on there. Okay, so that's a, um, kind of a, a lot on that first question, but kind of summarizing um, what you know, I would hope that um, if I were doing this sort of exercise with uh, with students or even just, you know, playing myself to kind of get a sense of what these kinds of plots look like. Um, the one thing I think that that is a, an important point is that sampling variability, which is a big deal concept in the introductory statistics course, um, sampling variability, which is just the chance differences that occur from one sample to another. Um, we often don't really start addressing that until we get to uh, numerical summaries. We talk about, you know, sampling variability and the sample mean and, and the sample proportion and so on. Um, but I think we could make a case that, that we ought to um, start be thinking about that um, in when we're talking about graphical displays as well. And that maybe bringing this idea of sampling variability in and kind of hitting it, addressing it head on when we when we look at graphical displays um, will um, help students be a little bit more comfortable with some of the calls that they have to make um, in terms of, um, you know, making judgments about these some of these graphical displays. Um, uh, another uh, another thing in terms of the summary is uh, the sample distribution uh, tends to look like the population distribution, uh, but much more so for large samples than for small samples. And and um, I think this is a point. I I know um, for many years I just kind of glossed over this, and we just said, oh, you know, if you take a random sample, uh, the sample distribution we would expect to look like the population distribution. Um, and in fact, when you start doing doing these kinds of investigations, we see that um, the sample distributions tend to resemble the population distributions in terms of center and spread, but especially for small samples, they don't really always reflect um, shape in, in the way that, that we might have thought. Um, and finally, in fact, I think I've just said that, for small samples, it can be very difficult to draw conclusions about symmetry. Um, and box plots and dot plots with small samples are not particularly helpful. So uh, normal probability plots may be the, a better tool for, um, for assessing normality on that. All right. Well, I don't see any questions that have been popping up. So I think uh, what I'll do is go ahead and, and look at these other questions and we'll, um, we'll, we'll look at um, uh, taking questions kind of in the discussion at the end. Um, let's see, so I see one, uh, one question there about software. Um, in our classes um, at Cal Poly, uh, we use Minitab and we use Jump, JMP, which is the uh, student, uh, the school version of, of SAS software. Um, but just about any uh, software, and even the graphing calculator, um, I think you, you may have to work a little bit harder to make something like this work with the graphing calculator, but any, um, any software that has the ability to take a random sample from a list um, or from a column uh, of data um, would allow you to do these kinds of uh, these kinds of exercises. I like if I have time in class. Um, it we have we're on I'm on a quarter system, and so we have long quarters and short quarters in the sense that fall quarter is always a long quarter because we get a few extra days because of uh, Thanksgiving week. We don't count Thanksgiving week as one of our ten weeks, and so in a fall quarter, when I have time, I actually uh, will make the. A, um, the population data available to students and have every student uh, select get a random sample from the population and bring their you know make a dot plot and a box plot and bring them to class and then you put them in groups and have them look at you know the say if there are five people in the group you have five you know different samples from the same population and to look at those dot plots and to start you know, building up the idea of sampling variability very early on and, and talk about, well, why aren't they all the same? Um, even though they're not all the same, they have some things in common. Um, and I have them look at the samples before I show them what the population uh, looks like. And um, it kind of gets them into talking about graphical displays in a um, in a different way and at a different level than just, uh, you know, saying, oh, graphical display, I need to talk about center, shape, and spread. Um, and I guess what I would hope they would come away from this is that if I'm trying to interpret a graphical display, especially with a small sample size, 
I might want to talk about center and spread, but I should be pretty careful about any general big statements that I make about, uh, about shape. All right, well, the second, uh, the second question on the list um, was, um, and this I thought was also an interesting one. If it, when I first looked at the list, I thought, oh, wow, these are hard questions. No wonder people are, uh, are you know, are thinking about these. Um, but what does approximately symmetric mean and how far from symmetric does a sample distribution have to be before we would call it skewed? Um, and again, I'm going to take the perspective of that what we're, that if we have a sample, what we're probably really interested in is the population from which that sample uh, came from. And so we're also talking about, um, based on um, a graphical display of a sample, uh, when would I call the population distribution skewed? And this relates to the first question that we just looked at because, you know, this, these are the first, um, well, these are the four uh, dot plots of the samples of size 10 from that very skewed distribution. Um, and with small samples, I, I think really the, about the only indication that we get from um, from a dot plot that the the population distribution might be skewed uh, tends to be the presence of outliers. If we have outliers in a very small sample, um, then um, that's an indication that more likely and than not the population was skewed. Again, not you know nothing definitive. Um, uh, definitive that we can say, um, but it's it's really difficult because if I were to look at these four samples from that very skewed population, if I were looking at sample the one marked sample 11 or the one marked sample 12, I would describe those as approximately symmetric, um, and not an indi you know I would not read an indication of a skewed distribution in there, um, and so that's you know that's something that um, I guess you know the message to students is it's really difficult, and uh, but we do it, um, and but when we do it, there's a there's a chance that we're going to be incorrect. So to kind of get them to be comfortable with that ambiguity and the um, and what happens as you you know have to in, make decisions or interpretations based on uh, sample data. Um, to look at this a little further, though, I think um, the other thing, you know, we've kind of looked at what do samples from a really skewed distribution look like, um, but the other piece of this is to have students explore, well, what do samples from a distribution that is symmetric um, look like, and, and how, how far from symmetric will the samples look like even when the population is symmetric. And so I've started here with a symmetric population. Again, this is uh, just uh, uh, basically generated from a normal distribution. Um, but then I wanted a, a, a fixed um, population that they could sample from. So I started with this, uh, this population. Um, and did the same kind of exercise. And so what we see uh, here are uh, samples of size 25, um, and I've kind of um, shown four samples, samples one through four here, are samples of size 25 from this normal distribution, um, and then below are the same samples of size 25 that we looked at um, from that very skewed, um, that skewed distribution, the dot plots there. Um, so you can see here that um, even when the population is um, is symmetric, we see sampling variability. Um, we don't always see, if you look at sample two, we don't always see that mounding up. We see a higher concentration of uh, values in the center, but we don't kind of see the mounding, uh, the mound shape that we see in the population um, distribution. Um, and sometimes we see, you know, outliers like in sample four, but the outliers, um, or if sample three, you can see we see ones that are kind of far away from the center, but they tend to be balanced on um, both the high side and the uh, and the low side. So, um, so here, I think if if we were to look at, and I should think if you were to look at any of these uh, samples of size 25. <clears throat> 
um, uh, that are from the, the approximately symmetric distribution, I think that the inclination would be to, to describe all of those as approximately symmetric. Um, I think we have to be careful not to over-interpret, you know, again, just a few uh, data points. When you have a small sample size, um, I tell students that if, if, you know, moving one data point over a little would change you know, my call as to whether it's symmetric or not, I, I probably should rethink my, uh, rethink my call. Um, it, so it's just a, a kind of a, uh, a difficult thing to do. Um, so we've got a few here that I'm going to say, you know, having looked at that, uh, just to get a sense of this, I'm going to show you some dot plots and then I'm going to ask you, uh, do you think this is a sample from that symmetric population or from that skewed population? And John's going to bring up a poll uh, for us and I'd like you to just vote. Uh, do, you, do you think that's from the symmetric or from the skewed? Okay, so it looks like I've got nine. We'll wait a minute more and let a few other people chime in here. Um, but it looks like we're getting a pretty, pretty good consensus here um, that this is, uh, and somebody's going to hedge their bets and go with the other one just to, just to, to see here. But yeah, it's a, so okay. So, so John, I think we can. So we got about ninety-three point seven percent saying for the symmetric. Um, and so let me move to the next slide here. So we'll, so this one, in fact, was a sample from the symmetric uh, population. Uh, so let's try another one. How about this one? Okay, I see votes coming in. All right, so it looks like so far we got 100% saying skewed uh, skewed distribution. Um, so let's go ahead and check on this one. All right, so this in fact was from a skewed distribution. So you're doing pretty well so far. I'm encouraged here. So let's look at how about this one. Yeah, I see the votes coming in. Okay, give you another few seconds to vote. Right. Again, here we've got a fairly good consensus. I got, uh, see, I don't know, could, could, John, can they see the results on the screen when you close it? Uh, yes, uh, I think everyone should be able to. Okay, perfect. So we got a pretty good consensus again here. So let's uh, that thinking that this one is skewed. Okay, you did a good job there. Okay, let's try another one. All right. So again, for this time we had really good consensus. Let's see if it's right. All right, and so that was symmetric. So, uh, so good for you. That's very good. But those were samples of size 25. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, uh, um, you know, those are those were easier. So now we're going to try a few <laughs> samples of size 10 and see how how that goes. So here's one sample of size 10. One of those populations, is it the symmetric or the skewed? And now I've kind of made this a little easier for you in that you saw the skewed distribution and the direction of, uh, of the skew here. So that makes this one a little bit, um, a little bit easier. Um, again, pretty good consensus. This was from the, um, the symmetric distribution. All right. How about this one? <laughs> 
Okay. All right, well, let's take a look at this one. So this one, we didn't get as good a consensus. We got 80% symmetric, 20% from the, uh, the skewed distribution. This is actually a sample from that skewed distribution. Um, but I have to agree that if I saw this as my dot plot, um, I wouldn't necessarily think it was from necessarily a normal distribution um, because I don't have the density in the center um, that I might have expected. Um, but I cert but I, I really don't think I would have said this is from a skewed distribution because I've got extremes kind of balanced on um, on both sides. So this is an example of one where I think it, it really is difficult. Um, and I think ha having students understand that um, that when you're just looking at the sample, there really isn't a right answer. What I'd like to know, um, I, I would be okay if students um, said either. Um, but I'd like to have them be able to express the reason, um, you know, kind of the reason why they chose what they um, what they chose. Okay, we got just a couple more. How about this one? Okay, let's see. All right, well, let, let John close that. Okay, so you can see again, not uh, not a consensus here. Um, this is actually was a sample from that that skewed distribution. Um, so the the more more people picked skewed than um, than symmetric, but it's it shows the uh, it shows the difficulty here, and 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 so I, I wish I had a good easy answer um, for this, but I, I think this is part of grappling with the nature of <laughs> the nature of statistics, um, especially the nature of statistics with with small samples. Um, one last one, and then we'll we'll move on to the the other question. So. Okay. All right. Well, I like oh, a few more votes coming in. Okay. So we can close this one. All right. So again, not not a consensus here. Another difficult one. This is actually a sample, a random sample of size 10 from the uh, from that symmetric population. And again, not what we would expe have expected because of the missing values in the center. It does appear to be sort of balanced high to low, but I would have expected a much more um, dense. Uh, you know, pop, uh, more to see more in the center. Um, but this really, I, I think, goes to show how much sampling variability there are there is in graphical displays of small samples. We wouldn't see this if we had done samples of size 50. I guarantee you that every every one of these would have been a clear call. Um, but when it gets to inference, I don't care if it's a sample of size 50, I typically don't care whether the population distribution is normal or not. I have a procedure that I can use. Um, where I care is when I have samples of size 10, uh, samples of size 8. Um, and that's where um, you know, it really becomes uh, becomes a, a judgment call. Um, there's a big debate in statistics education about whether we should call the, um, you know, for inference, whether we should call things assumptions uh, or just conditions. Um, and and I've been kind of in the camp that says, you know, we really ought to keep them as assumptions. There are conditions that we check to see if the assumptions are reasonable. Um, but they really are assumptions because um, I can't really tell from these graphical displays, you know, that uh, that a distribution is normal when I really have a small sample size. Um, so it's 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 an interesting uh, an interesting dilemma. All right, so kind of summarizing this, um, we'd say for small samples, um, it needs to be pretty skewed um, or have noticeable outliers before we'd move away from the approximately symmetric. But, but 
often we're going to be wrong um, when we when we do that um, and for larger samples um, not so much that it's much easier to see skewness in in that case all right well moving on to the third question and these last two will go a little bit quicker I, I want to be conscious of the time and make sure we have time for questions at the end um, how far does a linear pattern in a normal probability plot have to be before we would say the population distribution is not normal um, and so what we're going to look do is look at some normal probability plots and just a quick review if you haven't aren't familiar with normal probability plots we create them by putting the data in the sample in order from smallest to largest um, and then we match each data point with what's called a normal score and the normal score um, is just an expected value um, uh, of an observation from a normal distribution so for example we would pair if I have a sample of size 10 I could say if I were to take a random sample of size 10 from a normal distribution Distribution. In fact, we usually use the standard normal distribution from the standard normal distribution. Um, what's the expected value of the smallest observation in a sample of size 10? And we pair that with our smallest observation and we do that with each of the other observations um, and then we do just a plot of the data versus the normal scores and um, because we're we're um, matching smallest from our sample with what I would have expected for smallest in a sample of the same size from normal. Um, we expect to see a linear pattern in the plot when we when we do this as a two-dimensional plot. Um, so this is um, uh, what we would get. I took those same samples, random samples of size 25 that were from a normal population, um, and these are the this is the normal probability plots, and you can see that we get a, a, a linear pattern, a pretty linear pattern in all of them. Um, the one that maybe might be you know difficult here would be the the sample four, um, which looks like it does have a little curvature in it. But for the others, I see that strong linear pattern. Um, but when I do this with the samples from the um, uh, the very skewed population, uh, you see that we get kind of more marked cur curvature in these uh, in these plots. Again, here three out of the four. This the sample four maybe have been a little bit harder call, um, but three out of the four definitely have a curved pattern uh, to them, and it's a little bit easier to call. And even you know if we look at them side by side um, the normal population versus the skewed population I can definitely see curvature coming out uh, coming out here more more clearly and even for the samples of size 10 um, this was what we saw for the skewed population if I take my samples of size 10 from the normal population um, I get ones that are much uh, much more linear the sample number six this is the one that remember we had the one that had the kind of the gap in the middle which was kind of odd uh, for a sample from a normal normal distribution and that's showing up here as this weird gap in the in the normal probability plot and again um, side by side um, if I just look at them I see linear patterns here curved patterns for the skewed population and so I would argue that the normal probability plots are much easier um, to make the call. When normal probability plots were first introduced, people um, people said, um, you know, oh, but that's a judgment call, you know, and how, you know, what's linear and what's not linear. And you said, well, gosh, you know, um, it's a judgment call with any of, you know, any of the the plots. And and my um, I guess argument for normal probability plots is that it's a much um, it's actually an easier judgment call. I mean, I think my students have an easier time looking at these normal probability plots from these samples of size 10 and saying, oh, that's not from a normal population than they did um, with either the histograms or the, the dot plots. And I see the question about the normal probability plots. Yes, these are also done on Minitab. But again, most statistics software um, has the capability to do normal probability plots or uh, or at least to uh, get you uh, normal scores. And, and then you can just do a, um, a scatter plot with, with them. All right, now I think that because of time, I'm just going to um, go very quickly um, through this last set. Um, real, uh, and uh, this was the last uh, question about what kinds of patterns in residual plots should cause us to question whether a linear model is appropriate. The reason I put this last for the if we have time is just because this is the one that I think um, uh, is done well in most, uh, most introductory statistics books. Um, they don't necessarily have you experimenting to see how these patterns evolve, but they do a good job of describing the patterns that you need to look for. Um, and I believe that the slides for this webinar are going to be posted as well. Well, 
Um, is that correct, John? So if uh, you want yes, to go back. Yes, I can make sure that they're posted. Okay, so then if you want to go back, I'm just going to very quickly tell you what you'll see in this last bit of slides and then we'll open it to, um, to questions. Um, what I've done here is to say the assumptions, when we look at a residual plot in um, regression, it's usually to check to see if these assumptions are, are met and we know that uh, if they are met, we should have residual plots that where we just see random scatter around a horizontal line. Um, and so what I've done in the rest of these is to actually look at um, data again, ex ex exploring uh, data generated from a model where the errors really are normal um, and data generated from a nonlinear one but with normal errors and data generated from uh, a linear model but where I've um, made the variability in the errors increase. So small variability for one uh, x values between 1 and 3, more for x values between 3 and 6, and even more for larger ones. And then just taking a look at what kind of normal probability, uh, what kind of residual plot. So here's residual plot from data generated from what we would expect, you know, what we, uh, a model that meets our assumptions, and we see kind of random scatter around a horizontal line. Um, if you have a nonlinear model, even with, um, with uh, errors that are normally distributed, uh, you get a very marked pattern in the plot. And this is the, the plot that where the variability in the errors was increasing as x increases. And you can see that reflected by wider scatter um, as uh, around that horizontal line for the larger x values than the smaller x values. And so I invite you to go back and look at that, uh, that kind of, of thing. Um, and same problem with sample sizes here in residual plots. We're looking for patterns, but patterns are difficult to detect with, uh, with small sample sizes. So just to kind of wrap up here, um, you know, I've managed, I think what I've managed to do is take all four questions that were posed and address them without actually answering any of them. Um, but in my defense, I think it's because these, these are questions that don't really have, uh, have an answer. Um, interpreting graphical displays, I think, involves experience and judgment. Um, and it requires us to think about, about sample size. And so um, I think one of the things that we can do with students, we can't give them a good answer. It says if this, 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 and this, then you say, you know, it's, it's uh, not approximately symmetric. Um, but we can get them um, uh, to try and uh, be comfortable with the fact that it requires judgment um, and that they won't always be right, but what we're hoping that they do is develop the experience to um, the experience to to actually bring judgment to some of these calls and um, and uh, that's something that uh, is an inherent part of analyzing data um, when it comes from a sample and not the entire population. All right, so uh, I think we have now a little time for, for questions, and I'll also put up um, uh, this. Uh, I want to, if you have any comments or further questions that we don't get to, um, you can feel free to email me, and I'll try and respond um, uh, respond by email. I could also send you, I know the slides will be posted, but if you'd like uh, me to send you um, a set of the slides that have the graphs in, um, if you email me, I could also send you the slides from the, um, from the talk. Okay, so John, do you want them, if they have questions, you want them to type it in the chat room? Is that? Uh, yeah, so um, if you do have any questions, now would be a great time to type them in the chat room and I can read them out loud or you can read them. So I'll give everyone a couple of minutes to see if they have any questions, but um, some of you are already thanking Roxy. So yes, thank you, Roxy. So uh, if you want to thank Roxy in the chat room, right now that would be great as well so Mary has a question should we just stick to the more obvious patterns on assessments yeah that, I mean that's a good question because because um, how do you grade something that's a judgment uh, a judgment call um, I think that um, what I would do on assessments is I would either stick to something that is obvious or um, an interesting, and it depends on how big your class is and how many papers you have to grade, <laughs> but, um, but if your class isn't too large, um, uh, it would be interesting to accept, e you know, to put some of the more ambiguous ones and answer, um, but ask them to explain. Um, why they made that, you know, in other words, to kind of explain why they made the judgment call that they did. Um, and so that would be, 
would be something because getting students to kind of explain their reasoning is something that's that's uh, uh, I, I think we often don't give enough uh, students enough practice at doing. Um, let's see, I see. Does it make sense to test the significance of the correlation coefficient in a normal probability plot? Okay, so Jerry, that's a that's a good question. There is actually a set of critical values um, uh, when we talk about the uh, linear. You know that if it's normal, uh, you should see a linear pattern. Um, one of the things that you might think of doing that Jerry mentioned is is calculating um, the value of the correlation coefficient between the the observed values and the and the normal scores, um, and uh, that that is an accepted uh, thing to do. Um, it is something that um, and there are a set of uh, critical values that you can compare against um, based on sample size, of course, um, and. I actually like doing that. Um, the one uh, awkward thing, which although I, I don't find it too awkward, but is that I tend to do normal probability plots before I've done significance testing. Um, and I want them to make that call about normal and not normal. So I tend to just use the set of critical values as almost like the guide to the judgment. If your correlation coefficient is bigger than this, you could say that, but I don't go into the the full blown significance, um, you know, that it's a significance test with an alpha and and all of those things. Um, so uh, I hope that answers your your question, uh, Mary. I see posted uh, challenging ones for projects and simulations. That would be uh, that would be good. Yeah, I mean, if you if you do are going to do the the one where you have every student take a sample from some population and and do the plot, uh, that would be a good place to do it, and then they could just share their reasoning with each other as they compare their uh, compare their plots. Well, I hope, uh, you know, I, I felt a little bit, I see there's a couple more coming, but I'll just say, you know, I felt when I saw that when I did the questions and put the webinar together, I thought, you know, I'm, I hope they don't think I'm just taking the easy way out because I'm not really giving them an answer to these, uh, these questions. But, um, but I think that the reason they are questions is that uh, um, I, I think if there were a simple answer, they wouldn't have shown up on the list. So uh, I at least uh, console myself with the fact that <laughs> with that fact. So, let's see. Uh, students give random samples. Uh, yeah, team up for larger sample sizes. So uh, Ralph says uh, uh, have uh, give students the random samples to consider and then let them team up for larger samples. So, yeah, if you don't have the ability, I mean, one of the things that I've done if I don't have, um, sometimes I teach in a classroom where uh, students have access, at least pairs of students have access to computers. Um, other times um, I don't. And if I'm in a classroom where they don't, um, I do just provide, you know, you you. it's very easy if you have access access to software to generate 50 random samples and to just you know cut them up and give one to each student and have them uh, go from there. Uh, the, the key thing is as long as they understand that, um, that what they're getting are, are random samples um, and they understand that process, um, that's what you really uh, you really want them to do. Um, I've tried to develop a series of um, exercises because uh, to I think the, the biggest idea in intro intro stat um, that underlies everything is this idea of sampling variability. And um, you know, in thinking about how we teach intro stat, I realize that we often leave a discussion of sampling variability until we get to sampling distributions, um, and then we kind of hit it with them and run. To inference and um, and so I I think that um, you know I've tried to write a series of exercises that start right from the beginning always looking at this idea of sampling variability which then would include looking at sampling variability in um, in graphical displays as well as just um, just numerical summaries and it it's been interesting um, uh, to do that uh, I think and, and I think useful um, as well. Let's see. Mary says, is it an important learning outcome for students to be able to match sample statistics to plot um, uh, in plots uh, to histograms? So, so she's asking. So, so there are a number of activities out there where um, students are giving a set of um, uh, sample statistics like mean, median, quartiles, and so on, and then a set of uh, box plots or a set of histograms and asked to match those up. Um, I think that that, that is um, uh, an important um, 
yeah, whole plots, a box plots. <laughs> Good. Um, I, I think that is a useful thing to ask students to do because um, it gets them to um, relate the graphical displays and the summary statistics and to look at how. Um, you know, to be able to do that requires um, kind of an understanding of both the graphical display and the summary. Uh, also having the match box plots to histograms is a really interesting one without the summary statistics because um, it sort of helps them um, understand um, box plots which are a really big um, a sticking point for many students because they're so different from every other graph that we have students uh, look at. And in all the other graphs, Area is a big deal that, you know, area is proportional to relative frequency, but in box plots that's not the case. Um, you know, the little, a little tiny part of a box and a big part of a box still represents 25 part of, 25 percent of the data. And so that's a, that's a tricky, uh, a tricky thing for students to, to see. Um, the one last thing I'll add, as I know our time is just about out, but is um, the common core, if you're in a common core state, um, the one promise of the Common Core, if the Common Core is implemented in K-12 um, in, in an authentic way, is it actually has students start starting to think about issues of sampling variability as young as seventh grade. Um, and uh, so it may be a really different um, group of students that we get coming to our classrooms in uh, 10 years from now. Um, and it'll be very interesting to see how that plays out. Well, thank you again, Roxy. And again, if everyone wants to thank Roxy in the chat room, that would be great. And thank you to all of you for participating in today's AMATIC webinar. And if you'd like to support future AMATIC webinars, please consider becoming a member of AMATIC at bit.ly slash join dash AMATIC. And please remember to like AMATIC on Facebook at facebook.com slash AMATIC. And recording of past AMATIC webinars can be found at bit.ly slash AMATIC-webinars. And it typically takes us one to two weeks to produce and upload webinars to this archive. And if you need an email confirmation of your participation in today's webinar, please fill in the optional section at the end of the evaluation. And that link is now on your screen. And so uh, it only takes a couple of minutes to confirm and it will help me and the webinar presenter today know of how you felt about the content and the presentation today. So if you could please again take a minute to click on this link bit.ly slash amedic28 it would be greatly appreciated. And again thank you for participating today and I'm going to end the recording right now.